Hello and welcome here to the HGC Crucible North America. My name is Salah Jake, this is Jay Howe. We are your open division casters here for the gauntlet between Neventic and imported support. Yeah, we got here in somewhat surprising fashion through the last few, week, a few weeks. If you guys missed the playoffs, obviously things uh, shaped up probably not as we, as we expected if you followed the open division through our seven cups, but here we are at the precipice of the HGC potentially. And we already have the tone set from Europe just moments ago. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people said these open division teams, it's so hard to break from the amateur to the pro. Zealots have proved that it is very much possible, but let's look at the playoffs here for the Open Division to see our teams that made it through. Now at the top of the season, Jay Howe, the teams that were expected, LFM and UTA. They won more cups than any other team, but imported support, they won cup three, they won Cup 7, and they made it through the playoffs, which is all that matters at the end of the day. Yeah, and that's basically what it came down to, is you played for the seeding, you got there, imported support, we saw just crazy drafts. So if you guys were, you, we saw a little bit of Chogol in our first series of the day, imported support, not ran it once, not twice, but three times in the playoffs to qualify for the Crucible. And you know, you tend to think of Chogol as like a hero that exists on the smaller maps because you're, you're vulnerable to the lack of your ability to rotate. They won on Infernal Shrines, they won on Cursed Hollow, they played Chogall with Rhaegar, Malfurion, not just the standard Ariel. So, def in a best of seven, it's gonna happen here. It's gonna happen, but the thing that is very different about all of those games, none of them were against Neventic. None of them. <laughs> I true. mean, Neventic is an all-pressure team. It's like they took what worked for them a year ago, and they haven't let up. I watch this team religiously because I, there are several talented members on that team. And when I see them play, it's like no matter if they have a lead or not, whether they're down a talent or not, they are in your face fighting all the time. And I really wonder how Imported will be able to deal with that pressure. That's like my biggest question mark. They have never faced a team like Neventic. Well, yeah, Neventic definitely a powerhouse in their own right, even though they are here in the Crucible. Let's take a look at how they ended up here. Yes, Imported, they fought through the Open Division. They earned their spot. Neventic, they earned their spot a little bit less gracefully by being last place in the Pro League. But you look at this team, you see them in last place, and you say, they must be a weak team. Far from it. If you look at 2016, one year ago, same roster for the most part, they were actually considered easily one of the top three, and they're backed in a corner. I got a quote from Gilly. They're like a cornered cougar, where they're just gonna be able to rip and tear through anything that's trying to push in towards them. And they're backed in that corner all the way ready to fight. The thing about that 2-12 and 12 record is it's very deceiving. I was looking at some drafts just a little while ago. You know, they took a couple games off of tempo. They've taken games off of many teams. They've had many series where they, they had two games in that series. Just as easily, they could have turned that around. It seems like they lack some cohesion issues at time. Mm. But nonetheless, every single time, they're like must-see TV. That's who they are. No matter if they're 2-12 and 12 or whatever they were in the first half or the second half of the season, people were tuning in to watch them because anything can happen with this team. They have the potential, but somehow they've ended up here. But everybody likes watching them for good reason, for the memes or not, <laughs> but everybody <laughs> likes watching them. Like if. Um, well, <laughs> let's take a look at the schedule for this weekend. We've got two best of sevens for North America. Yeah, we've already gone through Synergy and Zealots, the 4-1 victory for the Open Division team in explosive fashion. Huge congrats to them. Up next is our team Neventic versus Imported Support, and then tomorrow, Be Genius versus Team Gang Gang, and then No Tomorrow versus Even in Death. And uh, man, Jay, how I'm so excited for both the series we get to cast because just to give a preview of Even in Death, they've got three members that have been formerly played at the highest level. Last year, these guys, Battery, Frozen X, How, they were at tons and tons and tons of lands, and they know uh, their opponents intimately yeah, in that regard. Absolutely. The number one thing, I mean, we're going to briefly touch on them because tomorrow I really want to break them down. Again, if you guys haven't really paid attention to the open division, you're missing out. They make a lot of subtle plays that you only see experienced players make. I, I've highlighted Battery and Frozen X so many times because they have the experience. Tomorrow's matchup I'm looking forward to. If you were to say, hey, what team would you see come out of the open division? They didn't win a single cup. But all season long, I said, if there is a team that I think can get into the HGC, it was even in death. And sure enough, they didn't step into the playoffs and win. They dominated their way to victory, and that's why they're here. Yeah. And, and I, I'm super impressed by them. I'm looking forward to them tomorrow for sure. Yeah, even death was definitely a team you were highlighting from week one. And, well, tonight, Neventic and No Tomorrow going at it. Let's take a closer look at the two teams and see how they feel about the matchup. 
Preparing against imported supports uh, this weekend coming up for the Crucible. We've been scrimming a decent amount, but more than anything, we're just making sure that we don't let them have their comfort picks on certain maps, and we have certain comps that we want to run that we feel like they won't be able to handle. I think our biggest strength is we have is our team's mechanics and our team fight. And I know that uh, imported supports like to group up in five man rotate or like five man fight. So I think we're stronger in that division. So we'll come out ahead. When I think of imported supports, I think of Ease, Cho'Gal, and unknown players. Staying in the league means a lot to us because I feel like more than anything, we let down our fans the first season. Like we definitely didn't play up to par, especially already being a top two, top three team the whole time we've been together. So um, winning and then st still being in the league, it just, it's our another shot. It's our, our second breath, our, our rebirth, so to call it. So we just want to go in there, prove everyone that we still are the same team we once were. We're pretty confident going through this weekend just because we had a good record against the Mente from the old Imported support and I feel like our team improved a lot this year and if we can beat them with our old team then we can definitely beat them time around. Individually we're all pretty good players. We're uh, pretty high ranked in Hero League. I think our drafts are usually pretty good and we have some things we like to run that you've seen in the past in the open division like Chogo and think that can help us out. We're really confident going into the Crucible and uh, I think this patch is probably the best patch for us because we have like Alrak players and Ariel players that are really good so I think it's going to be really good for us this Crucible. I think Nemantek will be surprised by us this weekend just because we're ready to bring everything and more. Cheese, Chogall, and unknown players. A quote from Big E, and that's what this is all about. It's about the unknown players coming in, you know, the amateur players, the dream of just trying themselves out, going into the open division, fighting their way through, making it through the playoffs, and now challenging Neventic. They don't know a lot about them. They have the intel on Neventic, and this series is going to be fabulous. Throw your adjectives out the window. You can look at Neventic drafts. They run stuff that was popular a year ago, oh, yeah. and somehow they make it work. Sometimes it's not always pretty, but they've got such experienced players. And make no mistake about it, the people that you are seeing on Imported Support, you're probably not going to recognize the names, but you will recognize them after today. Crux, huge. I was watching uh, a stream the other night. You said one of the best tanks in Open Division, yep. Crux, the aware. I have said his name so many times playing the support role this year. It is just incredible the amount of talent that is on this team that has basically come out of nowhere. Yes, they have some experience, but right. they're not household names. But these guys are good. Mm. And I, I really want to see. They have a very tough challenge. Make no mistake about that here against Noventic. But if they pull this off, I won't be surprised at all. No, me neither. And it is time for the Battleground pick ban going into the series. Now, it's a best of seven. And we do see Cursed Hollow. Yeah, Cursed Hollow, uh, you know, it's a favorite. I mean, if you're wanting to just get your feet wet, you know you can you can team fight at different times. You can fight around the objective. You have several different ways to manipulate the map mechanics. And that's one of the things that if you're trying to go that way, if you want to try and outplay that. You know, I talked about the fact that Noventic loves to be aggressive on bigger battlegrounds with enough terrain. Maybe you can work around some of that. Mm. Again, you talked about the fact that they weren't afraid to run Cho'Gal on this map. I doubt we'll see it. I doubt we'll see it. That was early in playoffs. It, was it wasn't early in like, playoffs. It wasn't the semifinals or anything. But the thing is, I, I looked at all their Cursed Hollow drafts, and they are unique with what they choose. It's not anything that you see often, but it is something that is very effective. Yeah, there's not like this, the same kind of telltale pattern. I'm curious what the prioritization is for banning against them, though. Ariel does stand out to me as a good option to remove. But even then, when you look at the past, they have played that Chogal with Rhaegar, with Malfur, and they're willing to flex be pretty flexible with that. But imported support do have that first ban here on the red side. Yeah, and one thing that we see sticks out a lot of times is on that backside specialty, a, a member for, no, or excuse me, for imported support. Sometimes they'll highly prioritize the hero that he's going to be on, whether it's going to be Greymane, who we've seen rise in popularity because he fits that hybrid role. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we might see an early rotation there, but it'll also be very telling the way that they want to shape their draft for imported support uh, as we all come back to that momentarily. Um, 
I, I can't. I mean, now I understand why Dredd and Geller are always dancing. Because the music, you right? You just can't stop. Lucio just has the jams. <laughs> Rejuvenation, man. Uh, it is uh, It is very energizing. You know, it's funny because we're back watching the last series, right? Yep. KO comes back there and he's like, can we get this picture? Those reactions. I'm sit we're, I'm back there. I'm like, I got to stop yelling. I'm going to lose my voice before we ever even go on stage. I, the energy is high already. I think yeah. based off of earlier, and this is just uh, keeping the keeping the beat going. I keep the beat going. <laughs> One thing I want to see is how will Genji uh, be prioritized? I mean, we were seeing first big Genjis all day in Europe, and he's the new hot, he's the new hero. Makes sense that he's very popular because that's a common thing. People, A, don't know how to deal with him, and B, he has that super high skill ceiling. Like the, the general consensus is, is Genji's going to get nerfed, and he's still going to be good. And people will just keep getting better with him, so he'll keep, keep getting nerfed. But here's the thing. The last week that we had that, and Naventic just kind of had the... We'll just say they had some weird traps, right? But Zuna played him three times. It's like a new toy, yeah. right? That Zuna's like, look, this is a fun hero. This is my type of play style. Zuna heavily prioritized him in draft. So I wouldn't be surprised if it could go either way. Instead, we're going to see uh, Nevinchik with first ban here. Because Imported had that for or had the map pick, so we're going to see the ban on Abathur. That means Nevinchik has done their homework. Again, I said that what they do is unique. It's not crazy, right? But it is unique to Imported Support's way of style. They can play normal, or they can try and throw you off balance. That's what I love when watching Imported Support. I have to agree with you, Jay Howe. And they're going to give this a bit of time. They've got 40 seconds for the timer. With Abathur being removed, we think, think about Cursed Hollow, you always think about the globals, you think about the big solo laners, and um, it's kind of widened up. Like, yes, Dahaka has received that nerf recently, early game, you know, doesn't have the same kind of uh, clear that you can have. Um, but you also have Zagara rising in prominence in North America in particular, and Europe. Uh, but Anubarak will be the ban here. He, did, how many games did he win in the, the series earlier today? All of them? All of them. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe he lost one game. He's good. Uh, now, First pick here, again, whether they go into something like Genji, the they go Cassia. Over. Okay, we've seen Biggie and Tomster kind of be on that flexible role. That'll probably be a Biggie pick, but that means we're not seeing first pick Genji. And, and I kind of like that. But Zuna is a very prominent Tyrael player. He was playing in NA long before other people were playing, especially when he was kind of playing that main tank role for Naventic last year before he swapped roles again. So Tyrael, we know on this battleground, has heavy priority because of the boss control, because of the lanes, the choke points that you can have, especially post-16. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if that might show up in the next rotation, but Greymane still here. You got to think that that's got to be high priority for one of these teams. Yeah, it's very hard to pass up the Greymane. All right, so Genji Greymane, very prominent, but then you always talk about there's the Genji and the Malfurion. Yep. Going for the support lock, uh, trying to play with that in mind. I mean, you know, Kenma, he's commonly talked about. Malfurion is definitely one of his one of his comfortable heroes, but we will see him play heroes like uh, Karazim here or there. He's he's going to be flexible with that. The, the Zarya is a nice balance for the in between, the tank and the, the warrior, and he's going to go for the Ariel, locking that in, takes that option away. Imported support will run double support given the opportunity. Yeah, now that you have Genji and Malfurion locked in, you can basically open up and use that as a counter pick. You have the next van, you have the next two picks, which means you can leave that last one flexible. So if you want to lock in that double front line, that extra warrior that you have up there, or some range damage, and then be flexible, that's kind of why I really like second pick a lot of times, is because the hero pool right now in our current meta is so deep that you mm -hmm. can start to use that last pick to kind of counter a lot of what's going on. And again, with Zarya up there, it makes Tyrael a little less likely, I think, unless they opt to go some type of triple warrior. So you got to start looking at heroes that Zuna might play that might terrify. And although Zuna has played a lot of Zarya in the past, but again, with that with Team Naventic, they're very, very flexible in how they switch around those roles between Tomster, Zuna, and again, Biggie should be on the Cassia pick, so we'll keep an eye on that. Okay, thinking about this ban, maybe looking at the front line. If they want to try to get that global option, they could go for the Dahaka ban because that gives your team a lot of control, that gives you solo laner, they go for the Falstad. So they are going for the global play, denying Falstad. Uh, again, so there's Varian quickly being hovered mm. and locked down there. Now, one of the heroes that we've seen Crux play a lot of, I don't necessarily like it as much on this battleground, but he has played a lot of Johanna. I love the Tyrael pickup, but that might be Swab's playing that secondary tank role. We got to see if they want to rotate that in. Again, with Crux being up there, he's been really dominant on the heroes that he's played, and he hasn't necessarily been challenged on those heroes. Johanna's somewhat of a safe hero, and it's somewhat battleground dependent. But what he runs, I, I think, again, I would love to see them go ahead. If they're going to run Double Warrior, go ahead and lock it in here and flex that last pick. 
I, I don't think you have a whole lot to worry about that you're going to lose in terms of that back line. You've got Specialty, you've got Ignition will likely be on the Genji. So we'll see here in just a moment. They go leave me. I'm with you. I was expecting to see Crux's hero. But, you know, like you said, it could be Crux and the Tyrael, and they could be trying to put swabs or uh, on, on, on melee assassin, a different bruiser, a little bit more of that frontline power uh, to dive with that. However, the Li Ming with Genji, the resets, the power at level 10. The resets are there. So if you get the resets, but I've always been not, I don't favor Li Ming into Azaria. Yeah, you just feed that shield. It, it's that predictable, right? Mages that have predictable damage are very easy for a good Zarya player. I mean, you don't even have to be great. B Kid on Muradin, that. I, I, the classic. I, I, it's classic, but it's a comfort, right? It's a comfort. Um, on the flip side of Li Ming, though, Cassia, she gets popped. She's all about the physical armor. She does really well against the Genji, sure. Uh, but Li Ming, even Genji at 13, though, once he has the, the shotgun blast, the Shin, Shinigan, or it's probably the wrong word there, is very, very good against that Cassia. Dahaka will be that last pick. Yeah, going for a third tank and their solo lane. So obviously Zarya plays a little bit of a support role, so if Cassia isn't able to build up that hope for Ariel to get those heals, Dahak has self-sustained, Murden has self-sustained, Zarya has that extra support. So yeah. you have a very tough composition to take down. You mentioned the Cassia armor, but that doesn't do anything against the likes of Li Ming and the potential uh, shurikens that are coming out from Genji. So now we've got to look at this. Are you willing to run a solo Tyrael against a triple front line? I mean, you already have a double back on Genji's a weird hybrid hero, right? He can play range, but he goes into that melee and he becomes Become susceptible to potential blowups. Now, when we look at that, you only have Muradin and Dahaka with that hard CC. So we'll see how aggressive he wants to be. I feel like they've got to have somebody on the front line, maybe even Leoric at this point, if they really want to have that front line control. And this is kind of like another thing about Muradin that a lot of players have said in the past is that Muradin rises in prominence on, on land setting. Just because you're playing on land, there's no latency. And even just, you know, 30 milliseconds of lag, whatever it is, the natural lag of the internet that you play with it's a little bit harder to get the perfect Storm Bowl. Sometimes the situations, you know, that could make the difference on Genji getting away. So, yeah, that might be his comfort pick here in the situation. Leo was that last pickup to, to battle Dahak on the top lane, so it is the double front line. Yeah, and, and what you stated before is Dahaka's recent nerf. I mean, his W, nowhere near as effective. It's only really full wave clear post-13. Right. I mean, it takes a little bit longer, but he does have the only global in the game that we're going to be seeing, so that could be a huge factor, especially depending. I mean, we know that the, the tributes are somewhat predictable after the first two. We'll see how that goes, but the first one could be very telling in terms of how they rotate the camps and things like that and force imported support to play their game. Yeah, imported. I mean, this is a pretty standard composition for them, I'd say. I mean, Lee Orc does give them a lot of safety in the front. You've got the Tira for the big sanctification. That's going to be essential for a lot of the Genji plays we see. But I, I honestly think if they fall behind with this composition, it's going to get really tough to come back because it Lee is. Ming and Genji, they're kind of they're kind of win more in some cases. Like, yes, there is comeback potential for them for sure. But uh, the Triple Warrior, the Zarya Shields, it's going to be... That's what I'm saying, is that Rough. they have no just persistent damage. Right. Genji can poke a little bit. Until he completes his quest, the shurikens aren't that damaging. And you're looking at more of a later game comp. But then you look on the other side, you've got exactly the tools that you just talked about. The strength that they have, if Cassia can just put any type of damage out there, spread out the, those auto attacks from level one, feed that hope to Ariel. I mean, you're going to have a tough day in the office in game number one, but we'll see exactly how they can manage against that front line of Nefenti. Yeah, Lee Ming's got to find those over-the-wall, you know, orbs, magic missiles, hit that Cassia, try to keep her pushed away, try to keep her from getting all that damage for Ariel. I think that's one of the big keys to success, but we are ready for the first match of the series. Let's hop on in to Cursed Hollow in just a moment here. Jay, how I am pumped. I'm ready, man. We're going to see if Important Support can get on it as we head in to game number one of the Crucible here in North America. And that is going to be Naventic here on the left. Kenma on Ariel. We're going to see the rest of the team play out here as B-Kit going to be on Muradin. We're going to see Zuna on Dahaka, not on that Zarya, which means Biggie's going to be on that. And they're switching Tomster over to the Cassia. Interesting. Tomster and Cassia, we're going to see how he does there. Very strong player for sure. We've got Crux, the Aware, uh, Swabs, Magoo, Ignition on the Genji. Ignition is a player to watch for sure. And then Specialty, also another big ranged assassin to keep your eyes on. This whole team, very talented. A lot of unknowns for our, our friends at home. I know that for sure. But uh, you cannot count them out. They are a powerhouse here from the opening. 
Well, this is something that we see a lot of is priority on the bottom lane from a lot of teams. But instead, we're going to have, well, in a moment, we'll look at the top lane because that is a Zarya up there. And Zarya with Feel the Heat at level one melts these. You prioritize that. We see Zuna go ahead and use Brush Stalker down. But with Zarya and Cassia, this is a dominant, dominant force when you talk about pushing lanes early. Dahaka got picked off in the bottom lane, though, stepped out a little bit farther than he thinks he could. I, I would imagine the Roost just came through and the damage of Lee Ming and Genji being highlighted. They do have a lot of burst. And, you know, although they do have the Zarya to help absorb a lot of the DPS in the actual team fights, Dahaka can't solo versus three all that effectively. Yeah, I was a little bit surprised he actually went in that direction. And, you know, with the recent Dahaka changes, we see a different level one talent enhanced agility for Zuna, which Brushstalker's movement speed bonus now lasts for three seconds after leaving. Maybe he thought that he could go through that bush, get there a little bit quicker with his W. Instead, he got caught and got popped. Well, the top four did end up going down in quick succession, just the power of that Zarya. And then since it was the 3-1 the on opposite sides, you know, Leo can't really hold on forever. They put that pressure now onto the mid, just trying to get some of that early structures down. If they can push the wells down, that's even more favorable because, I mean, in the case the situation we have right now, it could be the first tribute spawning the top center of the map. That means there's no well available on the side of imported support. And, you know, it's kind of that coin flip victory for Team Neventic. Small advantage for them. Yeah, that window between basically 215, 245 is when you're going to have that call out. And it can be top middle or top or bottom middle. And we'll see exactly how that works for them. As we see, Zuna has moved up to the top. His Brush Stalker should be available in time. But he is getting punished so far early in this game. And uh, collecting that essence, again, with the nerf to his W, it takes a little bit longer to clear those. So you can't exactly heal up in the moments that you need it. That's true. It does take uh, a little bit away from that early game on to Haka. Well, we do have the Giants just being grabbed here. The Tribute will be spawning within the next 30 seconds at, at the maximum. And um, then that's we'll what, kind of see how they want to approach this. That's what Zarya looks like with zero energy, by the way. We yeah, saw her melt the tickle beam? With, Yeah, we saw her melt all those structures early with that energy. Good roots oh. onto there. As we see, Specialty was looking to lead, but the shield is there from Zarya. Going to soak up a bit of that, try and get a little bit of energy. But we do see the bottom. Now, Neventic picked up their Siege Camps, as did Imported Support. But they have Dahaka on the top. The Siege Camps are pushing top. The only difference is you don't have a fort up there. So you now have to try and escort those all the way to the keep. So you got to wonder if that was the proper strategy to push that top lane. You could look at it both ways. I mean, they have that, that global advantage in the top. and uh, But if the Tribute was in the top, there's going to be no well for them. But the engage here will force Dahaka to come down any moment now. BK very low does get that trait activated in the back. Tomster has the crown. They were forcing him away from the damage quite a bit, but Kenma at the full energy currently. Uh, the aware will be uh, pushed away from B Kid in the back, but we do see Zarya going down nicely. Swab's not going to chase behind that one tower in the minion wave, just trying to zone that Ariel away as Tomster. Now secluded, the boss is connected oh. with, but that nice reset for specialty, getting the kill with the orb. Now onto B Kid, who should have the dwarf toss. Yeah, let's hope he does. There's the Storm Bolt. He's going to walk away from that. And the, one of the key things about that, despite we, we see the experience advantage in the Siege Camp has basically reached that top keep wall. But the thing about that is Zuna was very distant on the bush that he chose to join in on. Instead of joining right in the middle of the fray or one of the two, he did the, the bush above the tribute and slow walked his way. I'm not sure he could have done anything once we saw Zarya go down, but you can see the difference. And now he's coming in here again. Not as aggressive with the Brush Stalkers. That one might have just been a, well, it, oh. it's actually going to get him uh, there quick enough. Yep, he read uh, Crux's position, knew the Aldurin's might wasn't quite ready. Got a nice kill, going to be able to hearth back. Won't have the Brush Stalker for a while. I think that the bonus movement speed from that level one, because it, the timing is different, you probably think, all right, I'm safe. But it's like, wait a minute, that's three seconds now. Try me. Ooh. Try me. <laughs> <laughs> I just straight up try me. 3v1 ignition going for it. Uh, we do have the bruisers in mid, but big XP lead for Neventic right now. Although that first tribute did go over to imported, they need to find some experience. They need to take down some towers or something, but it's the constant pressure here that Biggie enables with that Zarya. You throw, I mean, we see this a lot with Zarya. Whether Zarya is with a, a Cassia, a Vala, it doesn't matter. It enables you to get all this early damage on so safely. And then, of course, Biggie's putting the damage out as well. Ooh, nice orb from afar stopping that mount channel. All right, it is going to be here in the bottom right. We're going to see exactly how aggressive these teams want to approach this. The Aware started the channel, forced B-Kid to rotate Here's down. Dahaka. Yeah, Dahaka is now joining the fight. We're going to see if he can land the tongue. He does land it onto Malfurion, but he doesn't have the follow-up damage. The blinds are there. Leoric's walking away. 
Kenma just unfolding. Kenma zoned Ariel completely out. She's very low. Doesn't have the well uh, down in the bottom either because it destroyed that uh, in that last push. Big play there from Neventic taking the well down because otherwise there'd be a bit more sustainable for Leeming to be a little more aggressive. She has to go all the way around. Look for the damage behind. Ignition does get the interrupt there. Can run away with this. But uh, again, Malfurion just slowly trying to get the team topped off here. They're keeping engaged. They're keeping that... Aggroed. Does Genji go back in? No. Ken was going to get the second tribute. The good thing for imported support is they had that camp that was uh, left over there in the middle that was pushing, but we do see level 10 very close for both teams. The next tribute will be at the top left. And again, you talked about the well not being there on the side of Neventic. This time, they're going to have that fallback option up at that top, and imported support will not. Because it's one-to-one -one tribute, I'm curious if they're going to try and force the issue. The next tribute, both teams should have 10, so we'll see how they approach it. Yeah, the one game that we saw Synergy win earlier today was a similar story with the Zarya just getting a lot of early pressure onto the structures. And that gives you the experience lead, although it's not large in this case, but it also gives you the structure lead uh, with the wells and stuff. So that's that could end up being the the edge here for some of these early tributes, and we're going to have to see level 10 be the difference. This is kind of a massive power spike when you consider the power of Li Ming's and then that Dragon Blade of Genji. I mean, if they can snowball the kills, things will get out of hand really quick. Interesting that Tyrael, and I, I see no world where he goes judgment, unless they just want to pressure Kenma and see if they can pick at that one, but Triple Warrior? And your team composition, I, I mean, Sanctification just, I, I can't see them not picking that, but he is holding it, forcing Neventic to think about it. And he's going to keep on holding it. This is a good spawn again. Well advantage and side for oh, Neventic he here, but he does go for the Judgment. Onto Ariel, trying to force out that Crystal Aegis early. Will be used here to force them away. Crux is caught in the Entomb, and the damage is too much. Explosion Zone placed beautifully in the Twilight Dream from Kenma is on point. The explosion from that Death of Tyrael is good, but the reset's coming in for Specialty. The Aware on the retreat, trying to slip away. Swath Magoo has the Drain Hope to stay alive a little bit longer, but the Aware will be hit by that Storm Bolt, and that's going to be a big win for Neventic. That, that is a big win, and again, the Judgment is an all-in thing, and then they got locked in. The Entomb? I, I mean, it, it just it felt bad to be locked in there with Zarya's <laughs> Expulsion Zone. The Entomb's supposed to be a friendly thing there, uh, but either way, they, they did exactly what I thought they were going to do. You know, we, we know the story of trying to get onto Kenma on that back line, force the issue, and force them to try and just you know, not necessarily fold, but just fall off a little bit. They went in. There was zero hesitation. They just went in. I mean, it, it looks good in the beginning, but you ended up giving up a two for four trade. And that's, it's harsh. Like, like you said, it kind of almost looked like the Entomb and the Sanctification Engage worked against them because you're trapped in there with the Crystal Aegis about to pop on three members of your team. And uh, even with that, you know, Twilight Dream to try to disengage it didn't work out too well. They're going straight for the boss, about a level lead, which will be a talent advantage here on the side of Neventic. And they're up two to one with those tributes. Got Murden caught out up at the top. He was sniffing out. He was out. really low, actually. He was sniffing Murden, the boss. Yeah, Murden's going to go down. But he was sniffing it out. This is kind of like the old school Murden. Last year, before he had the changes to get us unstoppable on the Dwarf Toss, you used to be able to go in wherever you want and do those things. B-Kid knows that Murden is super beefy, but he wasn't able to sniff it out and then make them think that you were coming. That's kind of the thing. You send your beefiest warrior up there. Somebody has mobility and say, hey, we're coming, but you're not. It's a bluff, but... It worked out because they did not get their boss, but was that kill worth it? All right, they do have Zarya, so they might be able to stall this out long enough. Murden just respawned now and is on his way. Uh, solid zoning here, though, should be enough for that channel. You see Malfurion will grab that tribute 2-2 two two tied up. Level 13 about to be locked in. They do not want to fight without that, so they need to find the soak and they need to defend this boss. Well, one thing that we're going to look at, because if you actually watch that last fight, Zarya's bubble had worn off at the last moment that Li Ming hit Zarya. Now she's picked up Spell Barrier, Zarya did, picked up Spell Barrier to where you get that spell armor after the expiration or breaking of that personal barrier. Perhaps that's one of those things after that last team fight, it makes you think this is a much better talent choice. Probably could have lived in that last team fight, something we could have looked at, but uh, definitely a good pickup here for uh, Zarya. Also, level 13 means a lot more spell damage, you know, burst from the Genji. If you can find that single target, it's going to hurt very, very badly, especially in a hero like Cassia. He can find that backline, pressure the Ariel, pressure the Cassia, but Spell Barrier will be a good way to try to deny that damage.
All right, Jake, two tributes to two tributes. Next one is going to be our first curse of the game. We talk about 10 minutes into the game. We talk about now starting to open the battleground up, now starting to get that push. Now, Vitek has a slight experience lead, but depending on how this goes, will set the tone potentially for the rest of the match. And there's no backing away from this one. There is zero backing away. You're going to have camps pushing. You're going to have to deal with it. You have to fight. Zuna already taking a bit of damage, has to walk away. BK trying to zone. Now we're going to see the showdown. Okay, Judgment was the way the second fight, or the first fight opened up there in the top lane with the Heroics. Now, Crux, this time around, maybe he'll hold on to it for the mid fight. If they can force that Crystal Aegis to be used after a big combo from Leeming and Genji and have that not available, then Judgment is just a death sentence for that Ariel. This is uh, the problem with Dahaka, you start to just walk in, and it's very hard to walk in. The Twilight Dream is used. This Crystal Aegis has been used after Judgment's going in, and Kenma is locked in there into the Entomb, somehow wow. staying alive, as we have a two for two trade. Specialty is still holding on. Got some big heals from out here, but the drag in from Dahaka gonna finalize his life. Now Tyrael secluded on the run. Crux might be able to slip oh, away. Man. The aware will be body blocked and then help on the way from Zarya. The Neventic are just <laughs> so much stronger in the team fight. Let me just see if I can hide in this push here. Iron Forge momentum for B Kid. Every time he auto attacks, you do not walk away from that Murd. And now we have our first curse of the game. This is gonna be cleared up in the mid. Siege Giants in the top gonna have to be cleared up by Tyrael. But this, Neventic, that's the aggression I talked about. We're looking at a full level lead. Look for that to stretch a little bit further with this curse. Yeah, I mean, 16 being locked in now. They are going to press this advantage, marching right down the mid lane to take down the wall and try to challenge. Like, they get that one pick, they can take a keep easily here. So much beef with the Zarya Dahaka, Muradin, and Aro behind all of that. We're going to see as uh, it's really difficult to get that energy from the uh, towers if they don't shoot at you when you're <laughs> when you're Zarya. So you kind of hope, please splash some of that damage on me, Li Ming. But in, instead, we see Swab's Magoo. He's going to Wraith walk out of there. We're going to see the push into the bottom now. They're going to open up the keep wall. I don't know how much they'll get here. We only have 15 seconds. Getting the wall almost seems like a stretch. Low Zarya energy. They'll get the wall, walk away. We'll regroup and uh, start it all over again. The good news for Imported, though, Jay, they still sit on their second tribute and not that far from 16, so it could easily just as turn in a couple of minutes. Yeah, as far as curses go, that really wasn't too bad. Sure, they're pushed in, but they want to be pushed in because they want to soak that XP for level 16. And uh, they're going to be able to safely grab that and then find their place back on the map without taking any keep damage whatsoever, really. Like, yeah, they'll get a little bit on this bottom. Maybe they'll get the well. Uh, but 16 is just about here. You see Genji trying to soak that in the mid lane, and his rotation is well, the fastest in the game, really, uh, other than having a global. Uh, the, the posturing of Neventic there, they can't really do much. 16 is now picked up for imported, imported support, but the poke damage that they have, as we see the damage starting to be unloaded here, as we see the Drain Hope onto Beacon, forcing him to walk away, but the Siege Camp could be a point of contention, but we do have diving that back line. Genji is back there. He's going to try for the flank here. Okay, nice big orb going in. Crux is in a bad spot. No sanctification to save his life, and Judgment's not really going to help him there. So he just goes down to drag in from Zuna onto Malfurion, and this is looking worse and worse for imported support. They're on the wrong side of this. I mean, they're the red team, and they're somehow on the left of this. Try to use the Jukes for the Wraith walk out. Swab's Magoo should go down with three members down in a siege camp. They might be able to take this keep here. We're going to see what Genji and Li Ming can do to try and ward them off. Ignition just cannot get in there, and I, I really just feel like Sanctification would have made all the difference. When you have that Dragon Blade, you want that hard engage, just force the big damage onto your opponents. They're going to be clumped up so frequently. It's Triple Warrior, and Judgment so far not paying off. Yeah, not at all. I, I mean, it, it's great. You know, you have a strategy, but your strategy is literally to target one person. And, and that's really rare. I remember there was a similar strategy uh, when Dredd was talking about this on Tomb of the Spider Queen with B-Step versus Neventic. They tried something similar with a Jaina Tyrael comp. And it looks good when you first use it, but can it sustain right. in multiple team fights? And if it doesn't work perfectly or near perfect every time, you put yourself in a bad spot. They're just trying to find a way to break through this the armor of Neventic, who are playing safe. You know, this is a composition where it's just respond to your opponents, and that's exactly what they're doing. The expulsion zone, locking them in, barely escaping Crux and Swabs, but they're going to fall. Uh, at least Swabs goes down. Crux running for his life. Zuna is trying to hunt him down, but the Holy Ground will <laughs> deny that. I, I said it in the start of this, is that imported support has never faced a team like Neventic that is that aggressive and that good at team fighting. Yes, Neventic has their flaws, 
but they are still a force to be reckoned with. We're looking at 15 kills on the side of Neventic to only eight picked up by Imported Support. And, you know, it's it's honestly a, a pretty aggressive draft on the side of Imported. They're the ones that are coming into the fight every single time. They're diving in, and Neventic are just responding. They're counterattacking uh, in every battle, and it's, you know, it's, it's picture perfect. But unfortunately for Imported, they can't make an adjustment. They have to keep attacking. They need to push forward. They need to gain some ground on this map, and they've just got to find that right play to bounce back in. They're going for the boss. This is a, a, a risk that they know is needed pre-20, Holy Ground might be enough for the edge here. Expulsion Zone, though, on the other side. Now we see the Crystal Aegis was used. The Roots are going to go down. The boss All right. looks like it's going to be leashed. Let's see if they try and re-engage if they hit it with the Moonfire. Good Holy Ground. They do have Judgment in this case with no uh, no Crystal Aegis this time around. Swaz Magoo should end up falling here. Drain Hope still on cooldown. Oh, my goodness, slipping into the shadows. Holy ground, locks Tomster away from Crux, but b Kid's still up there on top of him. So many low bodies, but it's Zuna that goes down first. Yeah, Adaptation was so close to being popped there. The shield not able to save it enough. Oh, Crux oh. almost going down, uses that holy ground. The Eldruins going in, but they're going to look to re-engage. The Roots aren't able to catch anybody. b Kid, remember, he does have that healing static of 13 starting to go up. Avatar is there, oh, no. and now Swab's Magoo not going to be able to walk away from this. Ball Lightning doing some extra damage, but man. In that whole engagement, no Twilight Dream, no Judgment, no Dragon Blade. None of those abilities were used just because they were so spread out. They couldn't find the right moment, and they were afraid to not use it on one target. You know, I feel like maybe Tyrael could have judgmented onto a, a target to re-engage the fight, turn the tide there, leave that Muradin alone for like one or two seconds where it's a 4v5. Uh, but Neventic, they just held on with that Triple Warrior, and now they have level 20 with two more tributes on the board. Yeah, and the fact that that could be cursed next, imported support is in a very tough spot. Do you try and force the boss? Do you try and force a team fight down 18 to 20? Even if you were to force your boss, Dahaka can be there in an instant. Leoric always on the battleground. Dahaka uses a brush shocker, comes right in. So it's not an easy call to make. Ariel and we see Ariel and Muradin, they're just going to scout this out for a moment. But imported support, if they lose the next tribute and just give it up, they're going to lose their keeps. And that's a very tough game to come back from when you talk about not having the global on the map like Tahaka is. Yeah, you just out-rotate, find the boss, walk it in at that situation. So imported in a really tough spot here. Looking for that level 20, Crux not caught by the drag. That could have been disastrous right there. <laughs> yeah, that's one way to uh, just answer that question real quick. But either way, boss now up on the side of Neventic. They have a 20 tier advantage. They don't have to force it. They can wait to force a team fight around the next tribute. They don't have to do anything. Yes, it's appealing, but I like the fact that Neventic taking a more cautious approach than what I've seen from them in most of the season in HGC. Yeah. They, it, this would be the moment where it's like, you know what, let's just go team fight because we have 20 tier advantage. But I love the fact that they're playing disciplined right now. Yeah, they're ahead. Why make a risk? Just play safe. Because they're Neventic, that's what they do. I, well, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> But it's, it's good, I agree. It's good to see them making that adjustment in their shot calling. All right, 19, nowhere near 20. Imported support, looks like they're going to go for the boss on the other side, recognizing that the tribute's up there. If they can burst this down, this negates the bottom lane push pretty significantly. The problem is yeah. <laughs> they're going to give up their own boss it's with a curse. So like, this is really tough because they can't win the race. They, it's not like you can. At most, you get a keep, but even then, your minions are one health. You have to defend a boss during a curse without level 20. How do you do that? For what it's worth, you have Mirror Ball with Leeming. The problem is, is this keep's already halved out. It's, yeah. I, I, this it, boss is going to do core damage, guaranteed. It's, this is a likely winning scenario right. for Neventic. It's really hard not to see them. But if you are on the side of imported support, you cannot lose focus and try and be baited into a team fight. Yes, you have to do some damage out here, but you have to be able to take down the boss. B Kid doing all kinds of work, and you can see very healthy with this team composition. The boss coming in. You have to focus this down. Look for the team fight second. This boss already. This, it, it, Crux is tough. just getting bodied by Cassia. Thompson just going in. Heals come through, but the Twilight Dream from the Aware, it's just buying them time. Judgment onto the backside. They do get the Ariel blown up, so no support left, but the boss is on the core, down to 85% of its HP, and even if the team fight was lost by Neventic, it will not matter with this boss being so healthy. You've got to focus the boss there. It's going down. Neventic played a very disciplined late game. I love the fact that we're seeing Neventic. You know, we heard Zuna say in the beginning, this is our rebirth. I, I love the fact that they're now taking a very... Uh, they were they were dominant in team fights. Make no mistake about right. that. But they were 
very deliberate in when they took them and how they took them, and then at the end, not taking that fight. I, I just love the calls from Naventic from the last three minutes of that game. That is exactly what we've been waiting to see. Yes, you know, you're going to say it's important support. Regardless of who you're going up against, they made the right calls, and that's something that we didn't see a lot of in the HEC season. And it wasn't overconfidence either. They were just waiting for their opponents, playing safe, you know, playing smart. And uh, that earned them a big win for game number one, but it's a best of seven. So still a long journey ahead, but definitely a solid game number one coming out for Neventic. We're going to go to a quick break, and we'll be back in 